coming up on this edition of the Black Vault Radio. A juror from the 2013 trial of notorious crime boss James Whitey Bulger breaks her silence. Janet Euler, who found Bulger guilty of his crimes, also saw corruption at the highest levels of the Department of Justice and the FBI during the course of testimony. In addition, what she has learned ties Bulger himself to MKUltra experiments back in the 1950s, which led him to suffer lifelong effects. Did this play a role in a massive cover-up and Bulger's mysterious death in 2018? You decide. When I know, uh, saw this, I asked him why. You know, why'd you write at this time? Why aren't you sleeping? And his response was, well, ever since MK Ultra, I can only sleep a couple of hours and then I wake up hallucinating. He would tell me he'd wake up hallucinating and he would see wild animals in the room. And that he had never shared a room with anybody or anything, none of his pets even. Um, because this would happen every night and he would beat them up if they were in the room. Looking right at him, I said, Jim, did MK Ultra change you? And his immediate response was, Janet, you know it did. But definitely a human side. But then he could go just as quickly into this criminal element and tell me about crimes he committed. Um, and it was spooky. It was scary. It was like he changed, you know? All that and much more. So stay tuned. The Black Vault Radio is about to begin. More than 20 years ago, I began a journey. My quest for the truth. My name is John Greenwald, and I have hammered the United States government with Freedom of Information Act requests trying to get answers. I have more than 2 million pages of declassified documents for you to download at theblackvault.com. Now, I attempt to dive even deeper and talk to some of the most brilliant minds on this planet. No government secret is off limits, and no question is off the table. All I aim for is the truth. This is the Black Vault Radio. That's right, everybody. This is the Black Vault Radio. I am your host, John Greenwald Jr. As always, thank you so much for making this your podcast and radio show of choice. I know there's a ton of options out there. So as always, I am very thankful for you tuning in. Now, I'm pretty excited about this show. Here's why. Uh, as all of you know, I posted last uh, late last year some brand new documents that although the CIA argue have been out before, I don't believe that they have, and they were regarding MK Ultra. On top of that, there were documents about what they referred to as behavioral modification. In my mind, there's really kind of no difference between the two, but the CIA argued such. I got those documents and uh, posted them online. Well, they got quite a bit of press and, and media uh, attention. Uh, the, again, these, uh, these documents have not been out before. They may have been declassified. But this is what's interesting about government de declassification. You can declassify a document, but that doesn't mean that they just like post it out there for the world and say, hey, look at this. And so these documents, although arguably were declassified, uh, I, I don't think that they were ever in the public domain. I posted them online, a slew of media attention to it, and I got quite a few letters from people who claim to have been previous uh, victims of the MK Ultra program or the mind control experiments that they were conducting with LSD and other hallucin uh, hallucinogenic drugs. Well, one letter stuck out out of all of the ones that I received because with most of them, they were just people that I'm not taking away from the validity of their story. So let me say that up front. But obviously that they weren't really coming at me with anything other than I remember this as a kid, I remember this as an adult, I did this, I did that. And it's very hard to substantiate those claims given the fact that the CIA has largely destroyed all of the MKUltra material. So I get this one letter from uh, someone and she claimed to have been a juror 
on the trial of the infamous crime boss known as Whitey Bulger. And I looked it up and it panned out. She's exactly who she says she was. Her name is Janet Euler. And she told me a really fascinating story via email about her time as a juror, which then exposed during the course of the trial, extreme corruption against the Department of Justice and the FBI. She had found uh, Whitey Bulger along with the entire journey, uh, jury as guilty. And so he was incarcerated and put in prison. And there he sat until he was murdered uh, in prison, which that in itself is an amazing story. So I called her on the telephone. We started chatting. She came off of that trial, reached out to all of the players involved and started doing her own investigation. She's done a lot of work because Whitey Bulger then told her about MK Ultra, that he actually volunteered when he was in prison himself for the program. It was not told to him that it was a behavioral modification or mind control experiment. Uh, but rather, he was volunteering for experimentation to find a cure for schizophrenia. Fascinating, t twisted part of this tale. So she heard about it and did even more digging. So she's here to join me and talk to me and all of you about her research and her time face to face with Whitey Bulger. And she's got a very interesting side to all of this because most of us, all of us, if we know who that is, and again, he was an infamous crime boss, look him up if you don't know, and I'll, uh, I'll give you a little bit more detail here in the TBV Dialogue segment about what he did. Uh, he wasn't a great person uh, in regards to being this crime boss. He did some awful things. But it may tie back to his time volunteering for experimentation, which we f found out is MK Ultra. And so it is a very interesting look. Janet Euler, she's here to talk about all of that and get into the personal correspondence directly with Bulger. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to this because it, it really is a different take on what I primarily hear from those connected to MKUltra, and she brings a lot with her. So she's coming up. Uh, another couple announcements before we get going with Janet Euler. First and foremost, I'm very excited to announce that my book, Inside the Black Vault, The Government's UFO Secrets Revealed has been moved up with the publication date. By popular demand, the reaction has been overwhelming for me personally, uh, but the publishing company is very, very excited. They moved the uh, publication date up one week. In fact, I'm also seeing uh, pictures already on the internet from those overseas. So I'm not sure if the date was a little different or Maybe they didn't quite hold on to those copies as long as they could. Uh, but hey, you guys are starting to get your books overseas. Here in America, the new date is April 8. So you will get your books if you ordered from me already on or around April 8. Now, you will receive an email from me if you haven't already with tracking information. Uh, give me a couple days because uh, as of the posting of this episode... I am still signing and I am still packing. So that being said, if you haven't received it yet, don't panic. Just give me a couple days. If you really don't receive anything by the weekend, go ahead and um, either give me a call on the toll-free line or drop me an email and I will look at your order number and make sure that you get it. Also check any junk or spam folders. A lot of times when my... Uh, uh, system sends you tracking information, it might go to your junk folder. So make sure you check any spam folder. If you are interested in this, I hope you are because it is something that I am very proud of. And again, very overwhelmed by the response thus far about the book and the reactions by those that have seen it and were given review copies, uh, some in the media and uh, some for uh, just offering a couple lines of um, endorsements, if you will, of the information. Uh, it's been very overwhelming for me. But if you're not familiar with it, go to www.insidetheblackvault.com. Now, again, that's insidetheblackvault.com. And that will give you all of the details on the book, break down what's inside, and give you a couple uh, notes of the feedback that has come in thus far. George Norrie is on there. 
uh, with some feedback. He has seen it. Uh, Nick Pope is on there. He has seen it. Kevin Randall has seen it. And uh, Philip Mantle overseas has seen it. So they have all offered their uh, very, and again, it's very humbling for me. And, uh, and I'm very proud that they have seen it, critiqued it, and offered uh, some, some feedback on it. And all of that is available at InsideTheBlackVault.com. If it sounds worthwhile to you, you can order it right there on the website. Now, one last thing before we move on to Janet Euler. I launched this week a, well, a very controversial, it shouldn't be because it's factual, it is sourced, but a very controversial timeline to this drama that is the A-Tip saga. Now, the last episode on the Black Vault Radio, I gave everybody an update of where we were. Some good news about a FOIA appeal win, a Freedom of Information Act appeal win, actually two of them in the same week. That should be good news for everyone, regardless of what your thoughts are on ATIP. But of course, the naysayers are still on the attack. Somehow that's a bad thing uh, that I'm fighting for answers with the government and with those two FOIA appeal wins making some headway. But regardless, the naysayers are still out there. What I have not talked about in about 18 months, since October of 2017, I have behind the scenes been listening and chronicling and archiving and paying attention to all of the words that I can get my hands on of all the key players involved in the ATIP story. Now that includes the former head of the ATIP program, Mr. Luis Elizondo, former personnel, if you want to call him that, uh, officer, I don't know if that's the correct term, uh, but he worked directly with the ATIP program through Bigelow Aerospace's LLC that won the contract, Dr. Hal Potoff. There are quite a few other names that I included in this timeline, including the journalist that worked directly with Mr. Elizondo, Dr. Potoff, and the To The Stars Academy. I focused only on listening to the words of those directly involved with the program and then those who wrote about it in major mainstream media publications that work directly with those people, right? That's all I focused on. I didn't use the bloggers because <laughs> it's embarrassing uh, that are very, very pro to the Stars Academy. And hey, all the more power to them. Uh, but fact checking is definitely on their, not on their repertoire. So I only used those directly involved with the key players. And I created a somewhat graphical, I mean, it's textual, but it's a timeline-based breakdown, fully sourced 100% from top to bottom from all these key players on what ATIP was, what OSAP was, and tried to make sense of it. Now, why is this important? Well, since December of 2017, there has been an overwhelming response from the media to pay attention to this topic. So for me, somebody who's dedicated 22 years, and there are people out there that have dedicated more than twice that amount of time, it's important to get it right. And not only is it important to get it right, it's important to get it consistent. Because if the media starts catching on, those, those mainstream publications that don't talk about UFOs that often, if they start fact-checking a little bit more and pushing back a little bit more, they're going to see these in inconsistencies. They're going to see all of the information that you're being fed, me as well, that is changing, it's morphing. Dates all of a sudden change. They don't match up to publicly available information. Some people criticize me that I'm just using the, the US government's responses. So they make it seem like it's an us versus them scenario. That it's either you believe the ATIP people or you believe the government. But what I tried to do with this timeline was to show that there are multiple timelines, even when you don't even deal with the United States government or the Freedom of Information Act responses. You can completely omit that from the entire timeline. And by the way, there are very few mentions, there are mentions, but there are very few mentions to the government. It's actually all contradictory from those within the ATIP program itself. You should see the blatant, and I'm, and I'm not just, that's not my opinion. They are blatant, uh, blatantly different responses from Mr. Elizondo and Dr. Putoff explaining the history of ATIP. Why is that? They both worked on it 
and they both work together currently in the private sector. So you would think that somehow they would communicate and get their story straight. So why is it that they're lecturing in front of people giving alternate facts? So what I did with this timeline is show it. I didn't say, hey, look, this guy's lying or this one's fabricating or this journalist is horrible or uh, nothing. It's, it's not about that. I'm just offering that timeline so people can figure out who to believe. The problem is, is if you pick someone to believe, you have to admit uh, omit almost everyone else because no one seems to agree. And I'm not chastising the journalists only because what if they're getting false information? What if they are honestly reporting what they're hearing, but they are being misled? What if they're wrong and Mr. Elizondo's right? Well, that's weird because he was their direct source. What if Senator Harry Reid is wrong? What if he's embellishing? What if he's not? What if he's right? Well, if he's right, then you have to omit the journalists and you have to omit generally uh, Mr. Luis Elizondo. It's a complete, utter mess. And I laugh about it because it's humorous at this point. Now, I've already been attacked. People still don't get it. They think it's okay. And that's okay. I am not here to make you believe uh, anything other than show you verifiable sources. That's what that timeline is all about. I'll link it at the show notes page at www.theblackvault.com slash show notes. Scroll down, you'll be able to see the timeline. It's all over social media at this point. It's getting quite a bit of traffic just simply because there is a large amount of people, a large percentage of the general audience, the general public that wants to know the truth. I profiled in the last episode, the I want to believe syndrome. Well, we're seeing symptoms of that from some of those people, but I'm excited to see that the vast majority just want the facts and are interested in doing their own research. And that is what I've always wanted to provide at theblackvault.com. That leads me to this episode. I always want to motivate people to want to learn more. And when we get into it with an actual jury member that found the infamous crime boss, Whitey Bulger, guilty, she has a very interesting take on possibly why he is guilty. Janet Euler, she is coming up in the TBV Dialogue segment. Stay tuned. In this episode's TBV Dialogue segment, I want to welcome Janet Euler. Now, Janet was a juror in the trial of James Whitey Bulger, the notorious crime boss who led the Winter Hill Gang in Massachusetts. He was indicted in 19 murder charges based on grand jury testimony, but he stayed as the FBI's number two most wanted after he fled the Boston area after being tipped off by his FBI handler. He stayed at large for 16 years until he was caught in Santa Monica, California in June of 2011. Bulger's trial began in June of 2013, and he faced 32 counts of racketeering, money laundering, extortion, and weapons charges, including being complicit in 19 murders. On August 12th, Bulger was found guilty on 31 of those counts, including the involvement in 11 murders. He was sentenced to two life sentences. My guest, who was a member of that jury that convicted Bulger, had her life changed forever. But not for the reason you might expect. It wasn't Bulger's criminality, but rather it was the corruption revealed within the Department of Justice and the FBI, which was detailed in numerous testimonies that she had heard. In addition to make this story even more bizarre, Bulger has openly spoken about his experience being a victim of MKUltra. Yes, the CIA's mind control experimentation program. This occurred while he was inside Atlanta Penitentiary. After the trial, Janet spent five years of corresponding and having a personal conversation, or numerous personal conversations, with Bulger while he was in prison. She's the first to offer Bulger's story as told by him. That book, which is called Truth Be Damned, was written as a novel per legal counsel, and we will get into all of that. Janet, welcome to the Black Vault Radio. 
Thank you, John. I'm happy to be here. Well, I'm happy to have you. I have been excited about this. I know I told you privately. I want to tell you publicly. I wanted to apologize. You and I were going to do this show last week. And at the last mm -hmm. minute, I got a phone call from my son's school, temperature of over 101, and my whole world just kind of stopped because I have to go get him. And I wanted to say that I was very, very sorry. You set aside the time for me uh, last week, and you were so patient and so understanding. So I do want to thank you for that because I have been very, very excited about this uh, about this show. And. No problem, John, because your son comes first. Yes, no, he, he definitely does, but you are uh, yes. so accommodating, so thank you for that. Now, let's jump into this, because I uh, am fascinated. You had reached out to me about uh, your background and, and your story, and I knew it had to be told. I don't know how many times you have told this uh, publicly before, but as I mentioned in your introduction, you were a jury on Whitey Bulger's trial. And I want to take you back to that point where uh, I'm one of those rarities that actually don't mind jury duty. Uh, sadly, I never get called, so I've never sat on a jury. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm waiting for that day. I wouldn't mind it. I, I'd be very interested in it. So I want to take you back to when you were called in. Uh, let, let, it, let us know, like, how did you feel going in there? And did you know that it was for Whitey Bulger, this notorious crime boss? Or did you think it might be some kind of you know, civil dispute or something like that? Well, it was a federal jury summons, so um, and it had been in the news that he was coming to trial and they would be seating the jury soon. So I pretty much figured it out. And did you know much about him when, when, it, when you assumed it was him? I, I really didn't. I had lived out of the state of Massachusetts for the years that Bulger was most active, and I've never had an interest in organized crime. I, I'm probably one of the few that can say I never read The Godfather or saw the movie. And my children would always be telling me, you know, Mom, you got to watch this movie. You got to, you know, my attitude was, was no, I don't, I don't have to, and I don't want to. But I have to tell you, John, ignorance is not bliss because <laughs> I was a blank slate going in. And and um, it was it was not a happy situation. <laughs> yeah. Well, I assume that that might, I'm not a lawyer, but to a lawyer, I would assume that that's a good thing that you don't go in there thinking, well, this is the most evil man to ever walk the planet. So you're not going to be biased. Was that right. brought up during questioning? Um, I never really was questioned. I filled out the questionnaire initially that the entire jury pool fills out. And there were about 900 of us initially. And I guess they liked my answers because they seated me. I was more or less the perfect juror in that sense. All I knew really was the name Whitey Bulger and that he was supposed to be the head of the Irish mob in South Boston. I didn't know any of the the players. Um, so, yeah, I was really a blank slate. Wow. So forgive my ignorance. I, I On television, they always go through these uh, jury, you know, questioning that you sit down and you answer 12,000 questions and the defense asks you and the prosecution asks you. <laughs> so it, it, it's not like that? Or is, is it this a, a different type of trial? It can be like that. You fill out the questionnaire initially and then they start breaking it down, you know, sending people home uh, for whatever, however they answer the questions. And then if they have a problem with some of the ways the questions were answered, they will call you into a special room. I refer to it as the star chamber in the book, you know, wow. <laughs> that, that they, they get to ask you questions. And then they might keep you or send you home after that. And then ultimately, both the defense attorneys and the prosecuting attorneys can just send you home because they have so many, um, uh, uh, I don't know, jurors that they can just deny for no good reason, really. Wow. And so they went through all that, and I was never part of anything beyond the questionnaire. Okay. All right. Well, so now you're on the jury and the trial starts. Paint the picture for everyone. What is the kind of evidence that you hear the stories that they tell you i mean obviously you had a blank slate so what what was your initial uh introduction to, to whitey bulger well it was it was pretty um confusing for me and i will uh, 
step back for a minute. During the jury pool, they actually showed us the list of witnesses that potentially would be called. And both the prosecuting attorneys and the defense attorneys had huge lists of witnesses and some that, you know, I could recognize the name like a former governor or, you know, newspaper journalist, this type of thing. Um, going into the trial, um, I did the opening statements by the defense attorney, by Bulger's attorney, took me back immediately. Now, my background, John, is that I have written books on the American Revolution. Um, I have a great passion for the revolution. And in the questionnaire, I had actually let them know that I wrote these books on the American Revolution. One, because I wanted them to know that there's potentially the chance that I could write a book. I had no intention at that point. Mm -hmm. And two, because I had a background in the American Revolution and to some degree in constitutional law. So I thought maybe they'd send me home if I admitted <laughs> this, and they didn't. Um, <laughs> so going into it, and I'm sitting in the jury box, and Bulger's own attorney in his opening statement said that his client was guilty of many of the charges. And I leaned forward in that jury box, and I thought, what are we doing here? Yeah. If his own attorney is willing to admit that, which a defense attorney is never supposed to say, yeah. why were we even there? And I think that was the moment when I realized I need to pay attention because there's something more to this whole thing. Otherwise, that attorney never would have made that statement. And when he made the statements, I immediately looked over at Bulger and the other defense attorney, and they weren't phased by it at all. So I knew I needed to pay attention. Um Go ahead. No, I just get, I mean that's a little confusing, right? I mean he didn't plead not. I mean he didn't plead guilty. Did he? He pleaded not guilty. I, I mean what? Well, that's part of the whole confusion of the trial because things weren't allowed to be told to the jury, and many things I found out after the trial, um, facts that the jury was not allowed to hear, such as the fact that Bulger wanted to plead guilty and the U.S. Attorney's Office would not allow him to. He wanted to plead guilty to every one of the charges without appeal and take the death sentence, and they would not allow him to. Now, he had a stipulation for that, which we can get into later, um, was that he wanted leniency to be shown to his girlfriend, and they weren't willing to do that. In fact, they threw the girlfriend in prison more for a longer sentence than one of the witnesses had for 20 murders. So um, it, it, was, it, it was shocking from the get-go. I realized that there were a lot of things that the jury wasn't being told only because I had prior experience as a plaintiff in a case okay. years before that. So I knew how the jury would be taken out of the room um, often when things were discussed and they would never be told what was discussed. Um, and I knew because there were times when names would be mentioned and the, the assistant U.S. attorneys would just be, you know, uh, objection, objection, and yeah. the jury would be sent out, and those names would never be brought up again. So I realized there were things. Um, as far as m my confusion, it was very confusing for the first um, uh, week or so, because I it, this his crime spanned about 30 years, mm -hmm. and there were numerous players involved in those 30 years whom I had no idea who they were. They came into the courtroom, and there would be total silence when, you know, they would say their names. And I realized that everybody in that room knew who this person was, and this was very important, but I had no clue. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So there was a lot of, and the, the attorneys weren't kind enough to the jury to go in chronological order. They might in one day be talking about the 1980s, and the next day be talking about the 1970s, and then go back to the 90s, and you know, it was all over the place. So it took a while to figure it out. I would imagine. Now, before we get to the meat of the, of the trial, I want to ask you one last thing about that opening statement that the defense inter attorney leads off and said that he's guilty of most of these crimes. What it, what's the sentence he says after that? 
Is there a butt or what? Like, what is he? You know what? I don't remember. <laughs> I was well, in such shock yeah. by that statement that, um, well, I think he went on to say that the prosecution was going to present their case um, like a four, uh, uh, th- three or four course dinner, that everything would look beautiful and, you know, everything would be in its right place. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he went on from, you know, saying that it, it didn't occur that way. That's not how it happened. But he never said, why, Bulger? Yeah, well, he never said Bulger wanted to plead guilty. He never really, you know, got into that. And I have to say that when he made that statement, I was in shock. Yeah. I really, really was. So um, I can't tell you exactly what he said right after because yeah, I was no, and that, that's okay. Thinking, why am I here? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, and I know I'm taking you back quite a few years. The reason why I was asking was, did he have some kind of butt in there that he's, you know, pleading insanity that yes, he's guilty, no. but he was, fr- you know, so, something. No, okay, no. So, so the so the so you get in this from the get go. There's confusion. You know, there's something going on. You're obviously paying attention seeing all these fairly well-known people to a lot of those in the courtroom come in, what kind of stuff did you hear? Did anything stick out to you? Or did you at this point just think, okay, this guy's guiltier than sin. So what are we doing here? Oh, well, I knew he was guiltier than sin simply because his attorney because he told you. So, <laughs> um, you know, so at that point there was no, we, you know, it was almost like his, his fate was sealed in a sense. Um, there were many things. Every every day there were things that would occur. And again, as having background in the uh, revolution and the Constitution, um, you know, our founding fathers, one of the main reasons they thought the American Revolution was because they were being abused in the courts by Great Britain. They weren't getting fair trials. So that was a foundational pillar for them their willingness to die for that, a fair and just judicial system. And what I saw unfolding in the 10 weeks of the Bulger trial was anything but that. And it didn't matter that Bulger at this point in my mind was, was his own attorney said guilty. Mm -hmm. What was being done to, um, it was, it was an orchestrated trial in a sense. Um, and the, the, for instance, the w- main witnesses for the prosecution for the um, Boston U.S. Attorney's Office, the deals they got for their testimony were absolutely mind-boggling. You had four star witnesses, key witnesses, who their combined body count was probably uh, at, at least 50 people that mm-hmm. they admitted to killing. Okay, and the federal crimes they committed were every federal crime they were charging Bulger with. So you have a combination of all these crimes, and these men were given such deals. One man that committed 20 cold-blooded murders and, and admitted to it, including two teenagers who were in the wrong place at the wrong time, was um, he only spent six months in prison for every one of those murders. He was given money while he was in prison. This was all in testimony by the federal government. Wow. And when he left prison, he was handed $20,000 by the federal government. He was allowed to go on and tell his story and pocket every bit of money that he made off of telling his story. He was never held responsible for the lives he took. Um, and you multiply that. We had one FBI supervisor in the FBI who admitted to taking money from Bulger and two other organized crime figures. Um, and he admitted to being an accessory in two murders in that he gave information to Bulger that he knew would lead to the murder. And his punishment was he didn't get his pay for a month. He was, he remained in the FBI. He was promoted within the FBI and he retired out of Quantico. Wow. I mean, these were the daily stories that were being told. I could go on and on and on about it. And even though, you know, I wrote my book more as a Romana Clay, a fictional um, format, it is, you know, 90 plus percent true. Yeah. Well, let me ask you on the note on on the FBI, there was speculation and and the accusation, I should say, that Bulger was an FBI informant. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. He maintained that he was 
not an informant, correct? He did. He did. And during the trial, um, the 10-week trial, we had at least 10 days dedicated to the FBI informant file on Bulger that they were pulling all these, you know, things up to show us and, you know, to prove he was an FBI informant. Um, But in doing that, of course, the defense countered it. And I was more impressed with what the defense had to say about it than what the U.S. attorney said about it. Uh, For instance, the cover page for the entire file was wrong. It was not like any other cover page in an FBI informant file. All kinds of facts were missing from it. And they showed and they had four former FBI agents testify that the two agents that set up this informant file, quote unquote, John Morris, he was the FBI agent I just told you about who um, was promoted within the FBI, even though he admitted to being an accessory in murders. And then John Connolly was the other one that these other FBI agents testified that they would go into their informant files and lift files verbatim and change the date and the name of the informant or the number of the informant to make it look like Bulger was the one giving the information. And even during the trial, I had come to the conclusion that this informant file is highly questionable. When we went into deliberations after having endured 10 days of this kind of testimony, there was not one issue we needed to deal with that had anything to do with the FBI informant file. Did you feel that the informant file was fabricated? I believe the informant file was fabricated, and after talking to Bulger and corresponding with John Conley, one of the FBI agents who was responsible for that, yes, I do believe it was And, you know, even in your opening statement, um, you made the comment that uh, Bulger was notified by his um, handler that there were, uh, you know, warrants out for his arrest. Um, That's not what Bulger says. He heard it on the radio and turned around because, according to Bulger, he didn't have a handler. He paid them. He didn't, you know. Yeah. um, Yeah, he paid them for information. He didn't, you know, take anything from them so so then that's where and and uh, i'm happy to correct that that part of the introduction because that's obviously what sounds like anyway more of that narrative that is passed around about bulger but you have a very unique perspective which we're going to get into here with you corresponding with him but with the trial as we finish this up i know that there were a couple witnesses that I guess you can say that it disrupted the the prosecution's narrative uh, that came about. So before we get to the end of the trial, tell me about those two witnesses that uh, that disrupted uh, that disrupted this. There were well, and I'll take you back a little bit more quickly. Mm-hmm. Is that the whole narrative about Bulger, about Whitey Bulger, who he was, what he did, went back to that one FBI agent that pled guilty to accessory and murder, John Morris. He ran when things were closing in on him that he was being found out to have taken bribes from these organized crime figures. He ran to the Boston Globe and he told them that Bulger was an informant and he was one of the handlers. The Boston Globe went ahead and printed this story just taking him at his word. Now, first of all, an FBI agent is never supposed to release the identity of an informant, okay? The thought was, and actually a judge admonished him and the Globe reporters afterward, that their intent was to have Bulger murdered so he could not say anything against this FBI agent because they figured once it hit the press, the mafia would kill Bulger for being an informant or one of his own men and his gang would kill him for being an informant. Well, that didn't happen because nobody believed it at Mm -hmm. the time. So every book that came down, that book Black Mass, which Johnny Depp did the movie Mm -hmm. a year or two ago, that came from this FBI agent, the stories this, this FBI agent told. And every other book that's come down in the past 30 years was told by these key witnesses I mentioned that got away with murder. Wow. Really, they did. And it's because they had to give, and this came out in testimony again and again and again, they said that the assistant U.S. attorney would come to them not once to get their information, but three, four times. 
and two of them were facing the electric chair. And until they gave this assistant U.S. attorney information that he liked, Mm -hmm. he would not cut them the deal. They were going to go to the electric chair. Now, when we went into deliberations, half of the jury would not accept the testimony of these key witnesses because we figured who wouldn't lie in those circumstances. Yeah. Unless it was corroborated with other evidence, we would not even accept their testimony. Now, as for the two that, that kind of uh, disrupted the um, the script, I call it at this point, yeah. um, they were both charged with dubious crimes after the trial um, that had nothing to do with their testimony about Bulger. And um, one of them actually was facing a cold case murder trial. Um, somebody came out of nowhere and testified that this guy was involved in this murder. And um, I got in touch with his attorneys, actually. His name was Ralph DeMasi. And I got in touch with Ralph's attorneys and said, you need to get his testimony from the Bulger trial, and you need to see what he said, because he admonished the U.S. attorneys for letting people out of prison that were serial killers because they gave them stories that they liked so they could pursue a, a, an individual. And his attorney did get those that te- that transcript, and um, the trial went for five days. The jury deliberated for less than three hours and acquitted him of the murder because two of the witnesses were given such extreme deals from the prosecution for their testimony. The jury saw right through it. Wow. Now, yeah. now, towards the end of the trial, after you've heard all this evidence and saw the witnesses, and obviously some of this stuff that you're telling us you learned uh, after the trial, but did you did you get the impression, before you guys deliberated and before you found him guilty, did you feel that there was just this massive cover-up and this was fabricated and Bulger didn't deserve to face life in prison or, 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 or more than that? No, no. I felt like he needed to... Uh, go to prison. Okay. I did. Um, many of the way the RICO statutes are, um, many of the crimes, though, are guilt by association. I got gotcha. you. So even if we didn't feel like he was guilty of a particular murder, like he was charged with 19 of them, and, and he was uh, I'm, initially, and there were only 11 that we put on him, um, it was if his friend did it, then he did it. I mean, that's how it boiled gotcha. down, and you couldn't get around it sometimes, and it was so frustrating in deliberations because it was almost like, okay, if my friend goes rob a bank, I'm guilty of robbing the bank. So a lot of heated arguments over those things, but ultimately you couldn't get around it, and, and definitely some of them he was he was absolutely guilty of. Now, now obviously he was found guilty, uh, sentenced to uh, life sentences in prison, you started corresponding with him after the, uh, you know, after the, um, uh, after the trial. How long after did you reach out to him, or did he somehow see you in the papers and reach out to you? How did that come about? The trial ended in August, and by into the second week of September, I wrote this first letter to him. But prior to writing it, I got in touch with his attorneys, um, sat down with one of them for an hour. Um, and he gave me information that just blew my mind and the information the jury wasn't allowed to hear. The, the attorney, the attorney did. Yes, he did. Okay. Jay Carney. He was the one that gave the opening statement. He was the one I met after, um, I was in touch with the other attorney later as well. Um, I tried to get in touch with the prosecuting attorneys, never heard anything back from them. I got in touch with some of the witnesses, including the two that were later charged with these crimes Mm -hmm. at this time they hadn't been. I got in touch with Bulger's girlfriend, and I got in touch with John Conley, the other FBI agent who claimed to be Bulger's handler. He is in prison in Florida. Wow. Um, Now, I, I have to ask this before we jump into what uh, you found out from all of the, from reaching out to all of those people. What was your intent? Like, wh- to, well, it was to find out why. Um, well, after I talked to Jay Carney, his attorney, and Jay immediately told me that he had tried to plead guilty and they wouldn't accept it. Um, my my intent to go further 
was because of that. Why wouldn't wouldn't the government accept his guilty plea? Why did we have to go through this federal trial that cost millions of dollars for the taxpayers? Why were 18 people held in a jury situation for 10 weeks out of their life? Yeah. I mean, it was a hardship for every one of us. Um, I, I needed to know why they did this, given the fact that this man wanted to plead guilty and wanted to take the death sentence. And of course, at this point, I also knew because it came out in the trial. Bulger's girlfriend, Catherine Gregg, had been with him for the 16 years he was on the lam in California. And she had no priors. I mean, she had been a, a teacher of dental hygiene. She had no priors whatsoever. Her her crime was she fell in love with him, okay? Um, now, the probation department that came out in testimony in his trial had recommended that she be given two years in prison. Now, for what, what the federal... Uh, for harboring a fugitive oh, or being okay. with him. I got now, had she been married to him, nothing, or she had been his sister, his mother, nothing would have happened to her, okay? So um, instead of accepting the probation department's two-year recommendation, the assistant U.S. attorneys convinced the judge to throw eight years at her and the first year being in solitary confinement. Wow. And not only did they give her that eight years, but they have added um, four, three, four more years onto it. So she will be in prison for as long as Johnny Matarano was in prison, the man that admitted to 20 cold-blooded murders. And, so, and now, she's still in prison now? She's still in prison. And to add on to that, also in testimony, was the fact, actually, Johnny Matarano's former girlfriend testified herself. She had been with him when he was on the lam for the same amount of time, 16 years. She was involved in active money laundering. She would go fly from Florida to Boston and pick up envelopes filled with $10,000 cash to support Johnny while he was on the limb. And she lied to a grand jury. And her punishment for all of that was nothing because that was part of Johnny's deal. That's incredible. Now, at this point, as you're reaching out to everybody, and I want to get to you uh, getting to Bulger himself and writing a letter, did was there a consensus on why this was unorthodox, meaning they're they're throwing the book at the... You know, one that's harboring a fugitive, his girlfriend that's harboring a fugitive. Uh, is there a consensus on what is going on, on why they were giving all these special deals to target this one man? Um, basically, they it was just because he was the big bad mob leader, mob boss. I mean, <clears throat> that's all I can say. But it Again, like his crimes didn't even, you know, in the scales of justice, his crimes compared to the crimes of the witnesses against him were, weren't as heavy. You know, I mean, none of it made sense, John. None yeah, <laughs> I, and, and granted, a, a big crime boss, I get it. But I mean, it sounds like some of these people that they were cutting these deals with were no angels and in fact ranked quite up no. there with some of the number of charges. So does this really at this point for you, and, and maybe that's your final, you know, b verdict, pardon the pun on, you know, what, what yeah. all this, uh, what all this means, but it, is it just because this was the Whitey Bulger and they needed that conviction? So they were going to do anything for the win, or you had mentioned earlier, and I wanted to go back to it, uh, that Connolly was not the one that tipped him off, uh, as, as kind of that public perception is, is is largely believed but rather bulger was paying for information did i did i catch that right when you said that you caught that right he was paying a lot of money for information from the fbi which obviously is is corruption at its highest level when you start paying yeah. off a law enforcement agency so right. it's not just getting whitey bulger then there was a big backstory here where that mm -hmm. notorious crime boss who, okay, fine, if he deserved to be in prison, that's fine, but uh, we don't need to fabricate evidence. But if yeah. if the agency knew that he could bring them down in the sense that the organized crime at the highest level is paying the FBI, that's, right. that's bad news. 
Right. right. And it wasn't just the FBI. I mean, he had also corrupted people in the, the Massachusetts State Police, the Boston Police Force. You know, I mean, he he had corrupted a lot of people. And it was a lot of cover up, I think, damage control. Yeah. The trial was damage control. If if I want to move on to your correspondence directly with him. But on this note, I have to ask why, in your opinion, why wouldn't the government just say, hey, Bulger, you want to take the death penalty? Go right ahead. You, you'll sit in the chair and you're no longer our problem. Why would they chance some of this stuff coming out in a trial? Because it was very controlled. Like I said, um, uh, after the trial, you know, of course, I ran to the newspapers to see if half of this stuff came out that was so shocking to me, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, what do you mean the U.S. attorney went to these guys four times and wouldn't accept their stories until they gave a a good enough story, you know? It wasn't in the newspapers. It It wasn't in the newspapers. Now, you have to also understand again that the newspapers had been printing this stuff since the day John Morris went and said that he was Bulger's handler, yeah. that Bulger was an informant. And um, both Boston Globe reporters and Boston Herald reporters had written their own books. In fact, one of the reporters from the Boston Herald that came out again in the trial, the average person who bought his books had no idea because I've been telling people this and they're shocked. John Matarano, who killed the 20 people in cold blood, partnered with this journalist to write a book called Hitman, the story of John Matarano. <laughs> now, people thought the money was just going to the journalist who wrote the book, but in fact, John Matarano told us in his testimony that he got half of the royalties from that book. Wow. So, and, and this journalist wrote a, a number of books about Bulger. So you have the Boston newspapers also kind of complicit in this whole story because they had gone along with it for 30 years. Um, I don't know. I, you know, part of me, they wanted to control it, what got out to the press. Yeah. Um, I, I don't really understand why they went to all that trouble rather than just executing the yeah, man, you I, know, and, I, and putting I, Catherine in for two years. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, even if they wanted to control the information in the trial, what's to stop Bulger from prison or whomever from, uh, a, a, you know, after the trial that now they have no control, that, that, that these people can still talk, that if they just took him on his deal, that's, I mean, for me, that's just really a weird aspect to the story. But let me. It's let, very weird, yeah. Yeah, let, let me get you to your direct uh, conversations with Bolger. Now, you had mentioned you reached out to his attorney and quite a few other witnesses that were involved in the trial. Uh, did the attorneys put you in touch with Bolger, or at that point, did you just write the prison to his attention, or how, how did you I get stopped, in touch with him? I stopped at the prison um, uh, and asked how I would write to him, and they gave me the address and how to do it. Uh, his attorneys did not put me in touch with him, but he, one of his attorneys I know encouraged him to write back to me and to communicate with me because um, he told me that. Yeah. I, I got to ask, so, not to yeah. interrupt you, but I got to ask that you're one of the people that said guilty and he's there in prison. Cause you said, yeah. How do you, how do you start that letter? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In fact, I not only said guilty, but I wrote a, a piece to one of the newspapers after, because I was very vocal after mm-hmm. at, at how, you know, how could this have happened in the a, a federal court? These witnesses be given such deals. And um, I said in one of the first articles that I believed he needed to die in prison. So <laughs> I'll come back to that later. Wow. But when I wrote him the letter, um, I, I introduced myself as being one of the jurors and basically would have told you that, you know, I I thought it was an orchestrated situation. I was appalled finding out the, co- the you know, papers didn't cover half of it. Mm-hmm. And um, his <laughs> he wrote back. And he said, um, I don't trust judges, police officers, FBI, or jurors. (laughs) 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 He did, and went on to explain that he asked around about me, and people were telling him that I was speaking out um, about the trial. And so he decided to write me. 
And I decided at that point that the next letter was going to be basically just, okay, this is who I am. Mm-hmm. This is where I grew up. This is my background. These are, you know, just get on a level where we could identify in areas and go from there. And um, it seemed to work. I, you know, I believe he trusted me. Okay. I believe he did. From the get-go mm-hmm. or did it take a little bit of work? I think it took a little bit of work, but okay. yeah. Uh, he asked. He would tell me he was asking around about me. Mm-hmm. So what what did you start to learn after you were corresponding with you know obviously the man himself? You went through the trial. It was very controlled. You didn't hear anything. You've reached around lawyers, witnesses, and so on. But now you're at the source. What type right. of things did you did you learn in those initial uh, letters? Um, he would. Um yeah, basically bring out the fact that he had never given his story. These stories were all created by these men that got these deals that used to be his friends and kind of got these um, unbelievable and shocking deals mm-hmm. to give information about him, and which just drove me to ask more questions. Um, I saved a lot of the more personal questions because he did let me know right from the beginning, um, A, that he was a criminal. He told me never to forget the fact that he was a criminal and B that all these letters were being read, (laughs) you know, my Mm -hmm. letters to him is letters to me. So there were some questions I saved until, um, I got to see him face to face. He did put me on his visitation list and I was able to go, um, to the prison three on three separate occasions and spent about five hours each time, um, with him talking how was that seeing him face to face? Well, that's um, he wouldn't let me come initially without somebody. He wanted, you know, a brother or a son, you know, somebody to come with me. Wow, and, that's interesting. Uh, it was, yeah. And so my son actually was going to go with me. He put him on the visitation list. And um, tragically, my son died from an um, heroin fentanyl oh, um, overdose. I'm sorry. And, you know, thank you. And actually, Bulger had the most, um, the kindest letters in regard to it. And I had sent him a picture of my son, and he told me that he put it in um, a book he had of friends that had passed away, and he said, my son's name was Josiah, he said, Josiah is the rose among the thorns, which, I mean, there was a a human side to this man, which nobody would admit to, you know? So my sister ended up going with me, and it was kind of hysterical. She was, you know, she had read all the books, and she, oh, this is, you know, she's going to meet Whitey Bulger, you know? And so we're sitting there when we first met, and, um... Uh, she kind of awkwardly said so and we call him i call him jim because the police put the name whitey on him he never cared for that name Mm -hmm. so my sister says to him so jim jim do you you think you're gonna you know do you think um you'll be in this prison when you um you know and she's stumbling and he looks at her and he says what do i think i'm gonna die here (laughs) 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 and he looked at her and he looked at me and he pointed he says there was one juror that said i needed to die in prison and he pointed at me and i just looked at him and laughed you know and i said yeah and you still wrote to me and that kind of broke the ice and you know he started talking but um he showed a human side it both in the letters and in the direct you know conversations with him we'd be in a huge visitation room and it'd be all these uh it was usually small children there visiting their fathers in there with their mothers at a federal prison again and he would be playing peekaboo with these children um he'd be pointing you know janet janet look at that mother over there she's such a good mother look how she is with that little one and things like that definitely a human side but then he could go just as quickly into this criminal element and tell me about crimes he committed um and it was spooky it was scary it was like he changed you know um was there a tell me things did, did you feel like there was a psychological i don't want to say disorder because i don't mean that uh insultingly right. you know because obviously you guys had a a friendship um despite the weird circumstance so yeah. i don't mean that disrespectively but if if he's you know going from what sounds like a very human person to this mm-hmm. criminal i mean do you feel that there was some kind of deeper psychological issue going on or was this just him 
there was something going on because it was a definite change in his expression, in the tone of his voice. Um, yeah, there was something going on and, and he was complex. I mean, that's the way I, w- I describe him to people that ask me. I said, he's very, he was very complex, you know? Yeah. And the reason why I asked about the psychology is he had talked about being a victim of, of MK ultra experimentation, which we know I've gone after a lot of documents on it. We know that a lot of that history has been destroyed, but in short, right. MK ultra were these various experiments using, different uh, types of drugs, mainly LSD in conjunction with a couple other things, depending upon what experiment we're talking about. Did this mm-hmm. come up in your conversations with him? That it, it did later, but it initially came up in his letters. Um, he would always put the time of day that he was writing the letter, the date and the time of day. Mm-hmm. And he always wrote his letters in the wee hours of the morning, anywhere from one to um, four o'clock in the morning. And when I know I saw this, I asked him why, you know, why'd you write at this time? Why aren't you sleeping? And his response was, well, ever since MK Ultra, I can only sleep a couple of hours and then I wake up hallucinating. And I, he wrote it, as a matter of fact, you know, and I looked at it because none of this was in the, in the trial, no, mm-hmm. no mention whatsoever. And I looked at it, and I was absolutely ignorant of MK Ultra, and I thought, what the heck, this guy's nuts, what's he talking about? And so I started asking around and doing research on my own. A cousin of mine was involved with the ACLU in Boston, and she's actually the first one I went to because I was talking to her about all this that I was finding out too. And I said, what is MKUltra? And she said, you need to get this, this, and this, you know, order these books. And one of them was the um, United States Senate hearing. And I did, and I started reading about it, and, you know, as I was waiting on the books and reading the books, um, I would ask Jim Bulger a little bit more about it, and at first he didn't remember a lot, and it was no more to him than he hallucinated. And uh, then he would tell me he'd wake up hallucinating, and he would see wild animals in the room and that he had never shared a room with anybody or anything, none of his pets even, um, because this would happen every night and he would beat them up if they were in the room. And I had remembered that, you know, at least on the news, people were making a big deal over the fact that when he was found, he had a separate bedroom from his girlfriend. And people were, yeah, right, he did, yeah, right, he did. Well, he said he did because of this, you know. And then he, you know, he said he remembered two guys in the the Atlanta prison that were part of it as well, and they were taken out stark raving mad, he said. And he always wondered what happened to them, and he couldn't remember their names at first. But as we kept writing, he started remembering things. He remembered their names, um, Jennings and Benoit. And one was taken out foaming at the mouth, and the other one was taken out stiff as a board. Somebody had... uh, had their hands under the head and somebody under the feet and he was stiff as a board. And he said, I always wondered what happened to them. Um, He remembered big machines being hooked up to big machines. He remembered um, being asked questions while he was hooked up to these machines. And he was told that he needed to journal what he was experiencing um, after the medication was given to him. He did have a copy or, you know, somebody had sent him one page of his hospital record while at that prison, while in MKUltra, and it showed how often he was getting the LSD and the doses of it, and they were very high. And at that time, he was getting it about three times a week, and this went on for 18 months, he said. And what, what was um, the, from what I understand, it was like 1957? That this was occurring? It started in around 56. He was 26 years old. Fif- and it was uh, it was presented to the prisoners as an experiment to try to find a cure for schizophrenia. And Jim said he had already been part of an experiment prior to that to find a cure for whooping cough. And, you know, he you know, gave great detail of, of what he experienced in that. 
but he, he, you know, he said he wanted to do that because all these babies were dying of whooping cough. And he said a lot of times the prisoners would do it not just to get time off their sentence. Mm-hmm. He said, but because they felt like they were part of society in doing it, that they were helping society. So when they came through with this, you know, a cure for schizophrenia, he volunteered along with a few other prisoners. So late, I know you said 56, but we'll just just rough it and say the you know late 1950s. He's he's involved in these experiments. Right. He's writing you after his trial, and my math's mm-hmm. not that good off the top of my head. But after the trial, 2013 or after, he's writing you at all hours of the morning, still yep. affected by those experiments that he took put, took part in in the late 1950s. Again, no lawyer. I am not a lawyer, but it just screams that that would give him some kind of defense. I'm not making excuses for the crimes that he committed. But what I'm saying is in in lieu of just saying I'm guilty uh, and trying to get the death penalty, if it's provable that he did this, did did he try and work MKUltra, the experiments, anything into the trial? No. No, not at all. I don't think he, uh, I firmly believe he didn't realize the extent of it beyond hallucinations. Yeah. And I, I mean, I haven't sat down with his attorneys and talked directly about it. I sent them information that I was finding after the fact, but um, I don't know that his attorneys understood the depth of it. And I, um, as we were writing, well, once when I went to visit him, no, I guess I had sent him this first, when we were writing, and I had read the Senate hearing, and, you, you, I mean, you certainly know that the, the crux of it was they were trying to find a way to modify behavior. Yeah. And it, they admitted to this in the hearing, um, and that an aspect of the the experiment was to see if people could be made more violent and even homicidal. Yeah, and and the true nature of MK Ultra, which is uh, it, it's fascinating to me, but sometimes uh, not in a good way, that they were trying to modify the behavior of humans in in many different ways. But they were putting it under the guise of, well, we're looking for a cure for schizophrenia. They were, uh, you know, kind of making it a little bit more. Um, scientific and that their intentions were not really known. Uh, I've talked about it on this program before. We we spoke about present day DARPA experiments that get into planting implanting chips into brains and essentially it's mm-hmm. mind control going right back to those experiments in the 50s with hallucinogenic right. drugs and and stuff like that. They're doing it in a different way. Today, the story is they're trying to help wounded veterans and link their brain to mechanical limbs and so on. It is a terrifying realm of science and something that goes Mm -hmm. back decades and decades. And again, I just kind of go back to uh, now that you've informed the lawyers, why wouldn't they maybe able to appeal and say, okay, after the trial, uh, this kind of came to light. And, um, you know, this this might be playing into his modified behavior that after being in, right. in the mid to late uh, 20s uh, when he was experimented on that it could have I can't honest I can't honestly answer it but mm-hmm. I think the um he was already um tried and convicted well before his trial if you will um and I have questioned and continue to question I don't think the courts would have allowed it because I don't think they would have allowed anything that public about what the CIA did back in the 1950s. Yeah. Um, And part of the reason he was murdered, set up to be murdered, in my opinion, I, I wonder how much of that played into it. Well, yeah. And I want to get to that because for those who don't know, he was murdered uh, in prison and uh, I want you to tell that part of the story, but I want you to also uh, first address where you, corresponding with him until he was murdered in prison or did the correspondence stop no the correspondence never stopped i got a letter from him 10 days before he was murdered and also john i was going to say before that one of the times i went to visit him the last time i went to visit him that i was allowed to visit him um 
I did ask him about MK Ultra directly. You mm-hmm. know, I, I looking right at him, I said, Jim, did MK Ultra change you? And his immediate response was, Janet, you know it did. I hallucinate. And I leaned in toward him and I said, Jim, did it change you? Mm-hmm. And he looked around the room for a couple seconds and looked back at me and said, yes, it changed me. Were his crimes, because he was in prison very young and maybe even before the age of 26, were they violent at this point? Was he showing violent no. tendencies or were these kind of small time things and it uh, got a lot worse as well, years went on? he was in bank robbery. He was in there for bank robbery. Mm-hmm. His crimes prior to, no, he had never murdered anybody. Um, and in fact, when he got out of prison 10 years um, later, he was in for 10 years. He uh, came back to Boston, got a job, had a girlfriend, had a baby, you know, was doing all the normal things anybody would do. And it wasn't um, till he was probably back from 66 to 73 that he met some of these other uh, people that were the witnesses against him in the trial who had er already committed numerous murders prior to this, that he got involved in that. But the other thing was, John, and this is just... um, you know, uh, people don't realize this, but from the Atlanta State Penitentiary, Bulger was transferred to Alcatraz. And he loved Alcatraz. <laughs> is, now, he the, is he the only that. one that's ever said, I love Alcatraz? Exactly. And that's <laughs> the attitude people have like, oh my God, this is weird. Well, he got free of MK Ultra when he went to Alcatraz. Because he was part of MK Ultra until that transfer, and um, he had nothing but positive things to say about Alcatraz in the letters. I guess in comparison, Alcatraz probably was a, a walk on the beach. So when they transferred right. him over there, so at this point he already wanted out of the MK Ultra experiments. He he had volunteered but realized uh, that was a bad mistake, I assume? Well, he volunteered to find a cure for schizophrenia. He right. had no idea. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it was yeah. obviously, it was making him miserable. Right, right. He knew it was affecting him, and he wanted out. Yeah. And that was his way out, to go to Alcatraz. And that was it after that? There were no other experiments uh, that he found himself involved in after that? He never mentioned anything uh, happening at Alcatraz, no. Wow. No. Uh, Mm -hmm. amazing history now i know i've only got a couple more minutes with you but i do want to get now towards the end of his life you were corresponding as you mentioned uh with him towards uh all the way to the end 10 days before he was murdered in prison talk to me a little bit about that last letter if you're comfortable did he expect something to happen he expected to be transferred to a, a medical facility, a prison that was a medical facility. Jim Bulger, from uh, the time he was arrested in California up until that point, had suffered six heart attacks. And he had fallen out of bed numerous times when he was having these hallucinations. So onto a concrete floor, he had hurt his, his hip and they weren't doing anything for that problem. So he found himself unable to walk after a period of time, and he was absolutely confined to a wheelchair. When I went to visit him, I saw his legs. His uh, circulation was very poor. I knew about his heart condition because he would discuss it frequently in the letters. He was on nitroglycerin. He had been to the hospital numerous times with these heart attacks, thought he was going to die. And he was 89 years old. (laughs) So um, he was anticipating a move to a medical facility. I could go into more detail, but I know we don't have the time. And um, it finally occurred um, after eight months of being prepared for this. And he was sent to Oklahoma to, it's like a stopover point in Oklahoma. There's a prison where they wait until the the next transfer. And from there, he was supposed to go to the medical facility. Well, lo and behold, um, there was a statement made by the federal prison system that his condition had suddenly improved. So they decided instead instantly to send him to West Virginia, Hazleton, um, Uh, United States Penitentiary that had a history of violent murders already. Not only did they suddenly send him a condition that could not improve, I'm a nurse, uh, his condition couldn't improve. 
they suddenly send him to this prison and they put him in the general population. In other words, he's not being protected. He's not in lockdown. And within 12 hours of being transferred to that prison, he was brutally murdered. I have to ask this question because obviously he was en route to a different prison entirely. They reroute him. What are the yeah. odds that those prisoners knew that he was come? I mean, isn't it weird that, that there would be a hit on him mm. uh, unless they had foreknowledge within that amount of time? I mean, generally, if you see somebody like Bulger show up, you're going to have to sit down right. and formulate a plan. I, I, not, or you're not you know, going to know it. You, well, you're not that, going yeah. to know it within 12 hours. You yeah. Know? Like, yeah. Like all of a sudden, oh, Bulger's yeah. here. Let's go kill him. I mean, I'm not trying to make light of it, but I'm being no, you know, right, just kind of right. serious about the fact that it's very strange that after everything you've told us, he's en route to one prison. All of a sudden, miraculously, he's getting better, which you say is medically yeah. impossible, gets rerouted right. to a new prison. Within 12 hours, he's, he's gone. He's is, dead. He's is, dead. Is there any investigation into his murder? His attorney from the trial, one of the attorneys, is charging uh, the government with his murder for not protecting him because, again, he wanted to plead guilty. They wouldn't let him do it. So they really were uh, obligated to protect him. Um, so there's that trial. And I don't believe for a second it's the family trying to get money out of the government because this family knows that that doesn't happen. Yeah. It's to try to uncover who gave that order, who gave that order to transfer him to that particular prison i mean i'm so curious about that i have my 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 thoughts on it and also while bulger was in prison he wanted to talk to the media he was often writing to me i have letters where he says janet if you can find somebody to come in here and interview me i am ready to talk he had held to the code of not ratting on his friends all yeah. that time but in the last couple of years of his life, he realized that lies unchallenged become the truth and that they had told these stories about him and everybody believed it and nobody really knew who he was or what it was about. Um, he told me, I couldn't get anybody to go in there and interview him, nobody. He told me that um, he was corresponding with about 100 people worldwide. And he was coming to the realization of the depth of MK Ultra and what it had done to him. Do you feel that that, was, of, that that leads into the motive for this? I question it. I highly question it. Because if he could get people to start reacting to that, then what? They've kept it quiet. You know that, John. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's you know? uh, yeah, it's incredibly secretive. They don't want it out. I fought for years for documents and finally at which yeah. I think that's how you and I kind of met is that I and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you read one of the right. articles and reached yeah. out to me with this story. And I'll be honest with you, I received um, not a ton, but but quite a few uh, letters from people that uh, that talk about, you know, being a victim of MK Ultra. It's so hard to substantiate. Yours, right. uh, your story was fascinating when you reached out to me and I thought, okay, you know, this is one I can't ignore because this, this, you had, uh, you know, truth behind you where not mm -hmm. to take away from anyone else who wrote me, but it, it's very hard to substantiate anything. Right. Uh, but, right. but yours, I mean, you just have this amazing history, uh, with direct contact and, and, uh, correspondence with him. And, it's, and what he could remember, yeah. And what he could remember. And it sounds like if he started to turn in the sense that he was ready to talk, uh, mm -hmm. that absolutely makes sense that all of a sudden all of these you know stars align and he finds himself right. into a prison and 12 hours later he's, you know, he's killed. Um, right. Let me ask you your book, Truth Be Damned. I know it was per legal counsel. They recommended that you don't write it as a nonfiction. You had... I don't want to say fictionalized it because I don't want to take away. You said quite a, a large percentage is real, but again, yes. it's it's more of a novel. Is there a reason why they told you, hey, you can't put this in into a nonfiction book form? Well, because the assistant U.S. attorneys in Boston were charging people with cold case murders <laughs> and things like that. Yeah, and um, you know, I was warned by attorneys that you know they could come after me too if I stirred the pot too much but here you are bravely telling your side of the story has something changed for you 
Um, uh, when Bulger was writing to me, when he, there were many things he wrote in the letters that he did not want me to share. So that was part of it, too, that I, I kept, you know, I wasn't ready. Mm-hmm. I will say, even in that fictionalized account, the last 30 pages are excerpts from his letters. They are not fictionalized. They are what they are. Um, but after he died, um, I decided I don't want to hide behind fiction anymore. There's a huge story here. Mm-hmm. There's a huge story. Was Bulger a criminal? Yes. I give, uh, you know, one hour PowerPoint presentations if anybody hears this and wants me to come do it. Um, and I present Bulger for what he was, for what he told me he was. He confessed crimes to me he did not need to confess, that he was acquitted of. And he also told me about crimes that they charged him with that he had nothing to do with. And he went into great detail of how he would have done it had he been involved, which was very interesting. Um, I'm, I'm just tired of the story that was spun 30 years ago by the Boston media, and it keeps on being spun. And I question people after the PowerPoint presentation, can they say, without exception, that Bulger is guilty of the murders he committed? He, that people like to say Whitey Bulger was a monster. Yeah. Maybe he was a monster, but who created that monster? Yeah. What created that monster? And the same with, um, you know, Theodore Kaczynski, the Unabomber. Mm-hmm. Should that man be in the prison he's in in Colorado, or should be he be in a hospital setting, being protected and taken care of? Yeah, it's it's these, it, these it, men were created. Yeah, it it it's weird how MK Ultra has seemingly popped up into a few of these larger cases, and I mean, you're another example. Having done the research, the correspondence, and everything that you have proves that there's much more to this story that again has largely been destroyed when it comes to documentation but the results the victims the monsters that were created out of it seemingly have uh, have suffered in the true sense of the word and that this may not be the work of you know a human mind just being a little twisted but potentially the government making it uh, you know making them that way um, I don't want to. I don't want to ask too personal of a question, but if you don't mind me asking one here towards the end, can you describe your relationship with him uh, towards the end? I mean, was this a uh, s- strictly professional? You're just trying to get to the truth. Was it a friendship? Was it romantic? Was it all of the above? I mean, do, can I get personal and ask you what what it was? Yeah. You can definitely not romantic. No, mm-hmm. um, Bulger. In fact, he and Catherine Gregg. There is an amazing love story in that in that whole story. Um, I, I I correspond with Catherine as well. Uh, it became a friendship. Mm-hmm. It did become a friendship. As I said, like when my son died, and the the sympathy he showed, the concern, uh, often in his letters, the concern, Janet, you need to walk away from this for a while, or Janet, you need to you need to go on a vacation, you need to just shut it down for a while. Um, it, it, it became a friendship. And I would have continued going to visit him um, also, but the fourth time I went to visit him, even after waiting for two hours, going through the whole thing to get in there, I waited for two hours in the visitation room. And then was called out, and I was told I could not visit um, him anymore because I was a juror in his trial and because I didn't know him prior to incarceration. And I questioned the officer. I said, you knew I was a juror in his trial many years ago. I'm not anymore. And you knew I didn't know him because I filled out the paperwork stating that. And he just said, you can't visit him anymore. And he handed me my keys. And Bulger told me that he was on the opposite side of the door going into the visitation room for two hours. And they were waiting for a phone call to say whether or not he could go in. And they told him no once they got the phone call. And that was it. After that, you never saw him again. No, I was oh, told face I could to continue face. writing. Yeah. I could continue writing because I asked, can I write to him? He said, of course you can write to him. And, uh, but never could go visit him again. 
That's an amazing point to close with. I didn't know that, and it really kind of just puts the icing on the cake that something was going on, especially if you were trying to orchestrate, you know, Bulger telling his story and he was willing to do it. It, it, mm-hmm. uh, he, uh, you got a heck of a, you know, a heck of a story here. Um, I want to give out your website to look into the books because the truth be damned is only one of a couple that you have come out with, and uh, everybody can reach you at www. J A N E T U H L A R dot net. Now that has information about you and your background. For those listening, I will link everything that Janet and I talked about, including some other links of interest on the show notes page at www.theblackvault.com slash show notes. Janet, I really appreciate your time and uh, and honesty with kind of coming forward with, with this side of the story. I'm sure it's not an easy thing to do because I'm sure you get mixed reactions, it sounds like, from not only the public but maybe even the media. I do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, yeah. I wish you the best of luck. Thank you so much for joining me here on the Black Vault Radio. And it sounds like there's quite a few other aspects to this story we didn't get a chance to go into. So we'll have to bring you back and get into some of these details and do a part two, because it sounds like uh, we're still um, missing part of the story in a good way, in the sense that we'd love to bring you back and explore more. Okay, John, and thank you for what you're doing. I appreciate that, Janet, and thank you for your time. For everyone else, thank you as well for listening. Make sure you subscribe to the Black Vault Radio. You can find out all the ways to do just that at www.theblackvault.com slash show notes. This is episode number 28. Just go ahead and search for that episode for the show notes. But in addition, you will find all of the buttons you need to subscribe to this radio program. Also, if you're not aware, the Black Vault has an app. It's available for all iPhones and Droids. Just check your uh, respective store on the app. Just search for the Black Vault. It should come up. There's an icon for the Black Vault radio, and you get 100% access to every single episode of this program. And, of course, many more to come. So thanks again for listening. This is John Greenwald Jr. signing off. We'll see you next time.